In this video, I'm going to provide a definition for celiac disease, identify the common symptoms of it, and explain how it's diagnosed. Then, I'll explain how it's treated with a gluten-free diet. Celiac disease is an autoimmune disease that's characterized by damage to the small intestine from exposure to gluten. Gluten is an umbrella term used to describe storage proteins that are found in the grains wheat, barley, rye, and triticale, which is a hybrid of wheat and rye. Here is a simple illustration for it. A person with celiac disease eats food that contains gluten. When the gluten reaches the small intestine, the body incorrectly sees it as a threat, and so it triggers an immune response. This leads to inflammation of the mucosa, or lining of the small intestine, and changes the size and arrangement of the villi, which are the small finger-like projections that enhance the efficiency of nutrient absorption. Treatment therefore centers around removing the trigger by following a gluten-free diet. We'll cover this aspect in detail later in the video. But first, I want to highlight some of the symptoms of celiac disease and explain how it's diagnosed. Celiac disease is problematic for a number of reasons. For one, changes to the small intestine typically result in gastrointestinal symptoms like diarrhea and constipation, nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, and bloating. This can lead to inadequate energy intake and unintentional weight loss. It can also lead to the chronic malabsorption of nutrients. So, even if a patient with celiac disease is able to eat enough, they may still experience unintentional weight loss and they can develop vitamin and mineral deficiencies. For example, patients with celiac disease are at an increased risk of developing anemia from the malabsorption of iron or vitamin B12 and bone disease from the malabsorption of calcium or vitamin D. Beyond gastrointestinal symptoms, celiac disease has been linked to a number of extra-intestinal manifestations which means they occur outside the gastrointestinal tract. This includes headaches, fatigue, canker sores, joint pain, and an itchy skin rash called dermatitis herpetiformis. In fact, some patients with celiac disease experience extra-intestinal manifestations without gastrointestinal symptoms and may spend years feeling unwell without having a formal diagnosis from a medical doctor. With increased awareness of celiac disease, and increased availability of gluten-free options in stores and restaurants, and popularization of gluten-free living in traditional and social media, many people who experience symptoms consistent with celiac disease will self-prescribe a gluten-free diet before a diagnosis is made. While some may end up finding relief through this change, it's strongly recommended to see a doctor for diagnostic testing before doing so. The reason for this is threefold. First, a gluten-free lifestyle can be a burdensome responsibility, so we want to make sure it's necessary before it's pursued. Eating gluten-free requires careful inspection of every food that's consumed, not only with consideration for the ingredients, but also for the risk of cross-contact in the growing, processing, and preparation of food. It can therefore take a toll on mental health as a person has to continuously navigate shopping, cooking, eating at restaurants, and attending social events. Second, without testing, other possible causes may be overlooked. Conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and chronic pancreatitis have similar symptoms, yet each one requires a different approach to treatment. Finally, a gluten-free diet can interfere with the diagnostic process. A hallmark feature of the immune response to gluten is the production of specific antibodies in the bloodstream. 
But if a person with celiac disease is tested for those antibodies when they've been following a gluten-free diet, the antibodies may be undetectable. Thus, a false negative result may be produced, leaving the patient without a clear diagnosis and a future of unexplained symptoms should gluten ever find its way back into their diet. That brings us to how celiac disease is diagnosed. Before we move on, I just want to make sure you hit the like button on this video and are subscribed to the channel. Both of these things help me to reach and help more people. Celiac disease is not diagnosed through a single test, but rather through a testing process that can include an antibody test, a biopsy of the small intestine, and a genetic test. The first line of testing is the antibody test. Here, the preferred test is the tissue transglutaminase antibodies test, or TTG IgA test. This is often taken alongside a total IgA test, because some patients have IgA deficiency and will produce a false negative with a TTG IgA test. These patients can be tested for IgG antibodies, which is not quite as accurate as the IgA test, but can still provide clues if they're the best option available. A positive antibody test is suggestive of celiac disease, but it's still not considered enough to confirm it. Patients with a positive antibody test should undergo an endoscopy so a biopsy of the small intestine can be obtained. That biopsy will then be examined under a microscope by a trained pathologist, who looks for features like an increased presence of white blood cells in the mucosal cells, widening of the space between villi, and flattening of the villi. A positive TTG IgA test and a positive biopsy can be used to diagnose celiac disease. A negative antibody test suggests a patient doesn't have celiac disease. However, as mentioned previously, there are some cases where there's false negatives. So, if there's a high suspicion that it's celiac disease, like a family history of the disease and the classic symptoms of it, a biopsy may still be pursued. Genetic testing is considered to be less reliable than both antibody testing and the biopsy. Celiac disease is hereditary, and a person must have the genes HLA-DQ2 or HLA-DQ8 to develop it. But many more people have those genes than will ever develop celiac disease in their lifetime. A positive genetic test doesn't allow for a diagnosis of celiac disease. And yet a negative genetic test is enough to rule it out. Genetic testing is often reserved for when the results of the antibody test and the biopsy are in disagreement, or if for some reason a biopsy is not feasible. For instance, if a patient has a positive antibody test and a negative biopsy, then a genetic test can be pursued. If the genetic test is negative, then it's very likely that the patient doesn't have celiac disease, and the antibody test can be considered a false positive. If the genetic test is positive, then you can't rule out celiac disease. Another biopsy may be performed, or the patient may be treated with a gluten-free diet and have their antibody level reassessed at a later time. There are additional factors to consider and other scenarios that can unfold that are beyond the scope of this video. I just wanted to give you an idea of the process a patient might go through before they present to you with a formal diagnosis. Once celiac disease has been diagnosed, there's nothing more important to treatment than learning how to follow a gluten-free diet. This is because strict adherence to the gluten-free diet will promote healing of the small intestine and provide symptom relief. Patients should not be expected to learn all aspects in a single education or counseling session. Mastering the basics may take weeks to months, and then it will be an ongoing learning process as they engage with new items in a food environment that rapidly changes. Here's how I like to break down the gluten-free diet. There are foods with gluten, and there are gluten-free foods. 
Foods with gluten include the grains wheat, barley, rye, and triticale. Gluten-free foods include rice, corn, quinoa, and oats, as well as buckwheat, millet, and sorghum. It also includes fruit, vegetables including potatoes, nuts, seeds, and legumes, dairy products and eggs, seafood, beef, poultry, and pork. Oats have an asterisk next to them because they're often grown near wheat, barley, or rye, or are processed on the same production line as them. Therefore, patients are encouraged to only choose oats that are labeled gluten-free, a claim that's regulated by the United States Food and Drug Administration. Looking at these lists, it's clear that on a gluten-free diet, there are way more foods that can be included than need to be avoided. Yet I think it's easy to overestimate how many foods and food products are species or derivatives of these grains, especially wheat. Foods that are actually wheat include farro, spelt, bulgur, and farina. Wheat is also turned into flour to make foods like bread, pasta, and crackers, breakfast foods like cereal, pancakes, and waffles, and baked goods like cake, donuts, and muffins. Other common sources of gluten are beer, which can be made from wheat, barley, or rye by turning it into malt, soy sauce, which contains wheat, and seitan, which is a popular meat substitute that's created through the isolation of gluten. Gluten has even found its way into non-food products like medications, dietary supplements, toothpaste, and cosmetics. Although now that awareness surrounding gluten intolerance is so high, a lot of it has been removed. One of the main reasons wheat is desirable for making foods like bread, pasta, and baked goods is that the gluten provides a chewiness and elasticity that's difficult to replicate with grains that are gluten-free. This property, along with its ability to act as a binding or thickening agent, also make gluten a popular ingredient in food processing, even for foods that are otherwise gluten-free. Gluten can be found in seasonings, marinades, dressings, and sauces, soup, processed meats like sausage, beef jerky, and imitation crab, chocolate, ice cream, and candy. So, when it comes to choosing foods, even if they are gluten-free in the whole food source, close attention must be paid to what's added to it. With this in mind, there are three places a person with celiac disease should look for information when choosing foods. First, if the front of the package says gluten-free, then it should be safe to consume. As mentioned previously, in order for a food to have this, they must meet the requirements set forth by the FDA, which is less than 20 parts per million of gluten. This is a voluntary labeling option, so not every gluten-free food will have it, but many products made from flour do. Other phrases that are permissible are free of gluten and without gluten. Food companies can also send their product to independent laboratories that test the food and offer gluten-free certifications. However, the FDA doesn't endorse, accredit, or recommend any particular third party. The second place to look is the list of allergens on the food label. With the passing of the Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act of 2004, foods sold in the United States are required to list major allergens. This includes wheat, but not barley, rye, or triticale. So while it's useful, it doesn't ensure that the product is gluten-free. Warnings for wheat often appear as an allergen statement, or it will say in bold near the Nutrition Facts panel that the product contains wheat or may contain traces of wheat. The third place to look is the list of ingredients. In a perfect world, the ingredients list would just say wheat, barley, rye, or triticale. But in reality, this is not always the case. 
The ingredients are sometimes listed as a species or derivative of these grains, so it's important to know various keywords that indicate the presence of gluten, like durum, gram, semolina, malt, modified food starch, brewer's yeast, matzah, and vegetable protein. Oats can also be included on this list unless it's specified that they're gluten-free. The final piece of gluten-free living that we're going to cover is cross-contact. This has already been alluded to in previous sections when we looked at oats being grown near or processed with gluten-containing grains and other foods having a warning that says may contain traces of wheat. Going beyond these examples, cross-contact is a major concern for people with celiac disease during meal preparation. Accidental exposure can occur in the kitchen at home, or at a friend's house, school, or a restaurant. Anywhere in the kitchen that gluten touches can leave traces behind. The toaster, fryer, and refrigerator are all potential points of exposure. So are the cutting boards, pots and pans, plates, and utensils. People with celiac disease must take extra care to ensure that all surfaces are free of gluten, either through the thorough washing off of gluten particles with soap and water, owning a separate toaster, cutting board, and set of utensils, reserving storage space on the top shelf of the refrigerator and pantry, and preparing gluten-free meals before gluten-containing meals. While these are all helpful, perhaps the most effective strategy is for the entire household to go gluten-free, even if it's just one person who is susceptible. Navigating a gluten-free diet for cross-contact can become a little bit more challenging once a person leaves their home. Many restaurants are now offering gluten-free options on their menu, but unless the entire restaurant is gluten-free, there's no promise that the kitchen staff is taking all of the necessary precautions to minimize cross-contact. People with celiac disease should never assume that the appropriate precautions are being taken, and they should ask questions about the preparation methods prior to ordering. In recent years, personal gluten sensors have been brought to market for consumers to use. But at the time of making this video in 2022, none of them are considered to be reliable enough to replace human instinct and investigation. As a registered dietitian, working with someone with celiac disease requires you to find a way to minimize gluten intake and symptoms and maximize the ability to eat delicious foods and engage in social activities without fear or anxiety. Each session should include a comprehensive review of symptoms and recent or usual dietary intake using a dietary recall for 24 hours, 3 days, or 5 days. Dietitians may also consider assessing blood antibody levels and for specific micronutrient deficiencies guided by concern for malabsorption, low intake, or any specific symptoms that the patient presents with. Common laboratory tests that are obtained include a complete blood count, an iron panel, vitamin B12, folate, and vitamin D. I hope you guys were able to learn a little bit about celiac disease and the gluten-free diet today. Check out these videos if you want to learn more about nutrition therapy for specific gastrointestinal diseases.